we're here in this reality so we can interact. And we needed a reality that was constrained. <clears throat> if you want to interact and have feedback so that you can learn, this is a schoolhouse, so it was designed for people to learn. You need this feedback, you need consistency. You can't live in a fun house where everything you do you know, gets a different result all the time. There's no learning there, there's no consistency. So you need two things in order to provide a learning situation. One of them is you need a goal. You need to know which way is up, where you're going. Well, we got that. It's the lower entropy. The second thing you need to know is, is what are the rules? If there's no rules and no, and no constraints, there's no learning. Okay, imagine that you're in a, in a game with five other people and say, OK, go, play. There's no rules. How do you win? How do you lose? What's your strategy? See, nothing. You can't interact meaningfully without the constraints that define what it is you're doing. What this reality is. These are our constraints. Okay, well, where did the reality come from? You know, in the virtual reality games, somebody, some programmer has to sit down and plant every blade of grass where the grass looks like a big green rug, or they have to plant every tree and every mountain and every bird and everything has to be designed, right, by some programmer has to put that stuff there. This is not that way. That's simple enough that you can do that. This reality evolved. It's a simulation. The way you evolve a simulation is that you, at least this is a simulation, a good way to evolve it is you, in your computer, you say, well, let's have a whole lot of energy. Computers, that's easy, right? It's just a number. What do you want? You know, uh, a million, 10 billion? It's just a number in a computer. You have as much as you want. So you start with a lot of energy. You close it up into a very tight space. Okay, you give it a temperature, pressure, all kinds of initial conditions. Then you produce a rule set. These are the rules, the constraints. You say, okay, here's the rule set. Here's how this stuff interacts with each other. Then you press the start button, and what does it do? It starts to evolve. <coughs> this is the big digital bang. It starts to expand, right? And as it expands, it cools. As it cools, you know, gravity pulls the things together. Well, gravity's part of the rule set. It pulls the things together, you know, pretty soon you get galaxies, then you have planets, and you have suns, and you have, you know, you have little uh, cells, a couple of amino acids having to bump into each other, that sort of thing. So now you have this, it's all on the computer, right? This is just any, it's just a virtual reality game. Big digital bang. But now you have, what you've done is you've evolved the constraints for the individuated unit of consciousness like us to play in. See, when you go play World of Warcraft or The Sims or some virtual reality game, you can't just do anything. You have to do by the constraints of the game, right? You have to play by the rules. Otherwise, the game wouldn't be fun. The constraints are what give you the strategy. So, same here. So this evolved big digital bang then, that's the evolution that creates the pattern that we play in. Okay, so what are brains? Brains are the constraints. There's a constraint that we have in how we can interact. It represents the constraint. It constrains us based on the rule set. Because it's the rule set that produced the virtual brain. See, it was because of the rule set that we evolved here. We ended up with bodies, with brains that could do certain things. So if we damage this brain, right, something happens, we get a tumor or some other kind of thing happens, it increases our constraints. We no longer can do things that we couldn't, you know, that we could do before. Okay? So now our function is limited. Just like in your World of Warcraft guy, when he gets shot or something, his hit points go down or other things that make him less capable. He has more constraints now. Before he could run fast, now he has to walk because he lost his something spell or whatever. So he's got more constraints. Same thing. Virtual bodies, everything you see here is virtual. The only thing that's fundamental is consciousness. That's the only thing that's fundamental. Everything else is virtual. You know, this is a thumbnail sketch. I've gone like lightning across this. But then what about other reality systems? Yes, there's other reality systems. Yes, there's other virtual realities. Your dream reality is another virtual reality that you partake in all the time. It's just a different rule set. Okay, the time that uh, we have here is a local time. Our, each reality has its own time. What's the local time? Well, if you're in a virtual reality, I don't know how many of you do programming and how many of you actually do simulations, but simulations have, if they're dynamic simulations, they have an outer loop. 
The outer loop is the delta T. It's the increment of time. Every cycle, you increase delta T by one unit. So delta T is a, a microsecond. And you calculate everything, then you increase it by one more microsecond. You calculate everything again. And so if you're, you're simulating something moving, you get it here, the next microsecond is here, the next microsecond is here, and so on to where you get this motion. Now if the delta T is small enough, this motion looks very smooth. If it's not small, boom, 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 you get this sort of thing. Well, the delta T in our reality is about 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Very, very small. I mean, very, very small. That's, that's nano, 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 nanoseconds. We can barely measure a nanosecond. It's five orders of magnitude smaller than anything that we really can handle. So it looks real smooth to us. Time, a lot of people are confused about time. Time is fundamental to consciousness. Without time, there is no change. If you can have a before and after, which means if growth is possible, change is possible, you have to have time. Otherwise, you can't have a before and after. See, that, defines, that defines time. So time is fundamental. Without time, there is no change. Without change, there's nothing. There's no point, there's no purpose, there's no growth, there's no goal, you know, there's nothing. Up in the, in the science end of this, you know, I like the science end of it. I'm a scientist. But you have to think there's a bigger there's a bigger picture here. You know, it's not just all about the science. It's all about existence and what we're here for. It's about love. It's about growing up, you know, understanding your purpose, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and it is it is amazing because we are all one thing, and you can get around. You are consciousness, so you can get around a larger consciousness system. It's yours to get around it. You know, your consciousness. This is all just virtual. Well, see, I start sounding like, uh, you know, Lao Tzu or the Buddha, right? They're telling you the same thing. This is all just, you know, mana, you know, it doesn't, uh, it's not real. We're all one, you know, love, compassion, you know, it's, it's, it's very Eastern metaphysical. But this theory then supports all that. You know? And, but it also derives some physics that physicists can't drive today. Comes up with some, with some good answers and then answers all the mail about those reverse causality and, and uh, changing random number generators and all of this, which has been done over and over again in very, oh, very, uh, very careful scientific, you know, protocols. It's, it's science that just confuses people because they just don't understand it. But now there's another interesting point here, and that is if we live in this reality that is not objective, which it is not, then what does a probabilistic statistical reality do to the scientific method? The scientific method is really a big deal in science, right? I mean, that's what we, we live by. Scientific method is, is what separates, you know, the junk from the good stuff. Well, the scientific method has an underlying assumption, and that is that reality is objective. If reality isn't objective, scientific method isn't worth a damn. <laughs> right? Because the scientific method says that anybody can do the same experiment anytime, anywhere, and get the same answer. It's not true. What happens to Dr. Tiller? Somebody goes in and says, okay, we'll see if you're, you know, if you're kidding or lying or something. Here's my bottle of water. You know, mm -hmm. no, same, same pH. You must be a fraud. Mm -hmm. See, I can't do it. If I can't do it the same as you, then it's not objective. It must be a fraud. Well, it's not the way it works, you see. Or, they get, let's say they get the guy who did it before. But at the same time, there's a lot of other people around him that think the whole idea is ridiculous and it's not gonna work, okay? So now you have this guy's intent trying to modify reality and you have a bunch of other people's intent trying to make it come out objective because that's what they wanna see, you know? That's their intent. So it's not the same experiment anymore. It's not just any time anybody can do this, and then we say, yeah, hey, that stuff's all crazy because it's not repeatable, you know, people can't do it. Well, of course not, because our reality is not objective. It's not going to be that way. Our reality is probabilistic and statistical. So we and all agree that there's a table here and a house and everything, but every one of us has a different perspective as we're sitting around. All, all of us live in our own personal yeah. reality, and there's a couple of reasons why. One is your reality, okay, you get the data, but remember, you interpret it. You interpret that data, and everybody interprets it differently. We all see things with our own spin. And how do we interpret it? We interpret it based on our own experience base. Because if it's outside of our experience base, we can interpret it. Doesn't mean anything to us, it's meaningless. 
So we take everything and interpret it into metaphor. Metaphor is for us. Metaphors that mean something to us. Language is just metaphor. Symbols and metaphors. That's all we deal in. And they're all personal. Consciousness is personal. See, consciousness is not objective. Consciousness is personal. Your reality is personal. And you modify reality with your intent. That's personal. All this is part of the feedback. See, the system's designed for you to grow up, for you to you know, increase your, your uh, quality of your consciousness or grow spiritually. So that's why you have this feedback system. What you intend is what you get. You deal with it, you know? You're a miserable person, you, you, you're, on, you know, you're not nice, you're rude to people, what do you get back? You get a lot of crap back, right? Deal with it. You created it. See, that's feedback, that's a schoolhouse. You know, you get to, you have a lot of love, you got a lot of caring, you're really nice, you're helpful to everybody, what do you get back? You get a lot of sweetness back because people really like you, because you're easy to like, because you, you know, you're a very helpful, sincere person. So it's feedback, like any good schoolhouse. Yeah. Of the uh, fundamental forces, uh, gravity, electromagnetism, strong, mm -hmm. weak nuclear, would you say that everything here is a manifestation of energy and that perhaps what keeps this glass as a glass while it's needed is a fifth force consciousness? Well, you all, you're half right there, uh, Jack. When we talk about metaphor and interpreting things, you have to realize that everything is just consciousness. It's all data, okay? So that means things like um, energy, it's just a metaphor. There's no such thing as energy. Light, it's just a metaphor. No such thing as light, it's just data. It's our metaphor for something. Energy is our metaphor for something that makes a difference. You know, but something can change something. That's energy. If it absolutely can, can incur no change, then there's no energy to it. That's our metaphor for something to change something. Energy. I'm going to send you energy. You know, you're, you're ill or something, or I just like you, so I'm going to send you a lot of energy. There's no such thing as energy. I'm using my intent so that your future will be better. That's energy, but because I'm affecting you, we call it energy. That's our metaphor. Okay, I'm, a, I'm healing now, so I take this light beam, and I've looked at your, your physical uh, um, energy body. And I see that there's this black spot in it that isn't healthy. So I take this light beam and I burn that black spot away to where it's nice and healthy and bright light. There's no such thing as light. That light beam is just a metaphor. What makes you healthier is my intent to heal you, make you, make, make you better. You see, it's all intent. The Hindus have chakras, right? They have the, you know, the seven chakras from the root chakra up to the crown chakra. These are all metaphors. There's nothing fundamental about chakra. Just like there's anything fundamental about energy or light. So yes, that glass is there because it's part of our virtual reality game. It's just data. We interpret it. We get data that we interpret as that glass. That's it. So it's not that there are these other forces and there's this fifth force that's consciousness that makes the other forces work. The other forces are all just virtual. Just virtual. All there is is consciousness. And that glass only exists because it's part of our multiplayer virtual reality game. We all get the data, not because our eyes are getting light from the glass, we get the data from consciousness. We interpret it as that. And by the way, how do we learn to interpret this? That's a heck of interpretation, right? You got all these bunches of patterns of neurons and some little electrical signals running around in your nervous system. How do you interpret it as this? Well, we learn it. We learn it when we're born. We start learning it. We're lying there in that crib, and we grab hold of that foot and pull it up. We don't even know that's our foot. It's just something we grab up there and we stick it in our mouth, right? We suck on that tub. We don't know whose foot it is. We don't know where it came from. It just showed up. It sure does feel good. You know? And we learn what it is. We learn that that hand up there you know, belongs to us and we can actually control it eventually. In the beginning, we can't control it. We don't even know it's ours. So we experience and then we interpret the experience. So through that experience, we build up algorithms, if you want to call them that, that tell us how to interpret the data. With babies, children, as they grow up, they're learning how to interpret these electrical signals, these little pieces of digital data, into our reality. And if we didn't teach them, they wouldn't have the same reality we have. 